The legacy of Skinner River Kennels, founded by Mr. Winston Aaron. His dedication to refining both brains and looks into his hounds has set a golden standard that has thrived for 17 generations. Today, Ricky Campbell and Mark Summerall carry the torch with honor and dedication. Stay tuned to get an inside look into the history of Skinner River Kennels and the profound privilege they feel in preserving Mr. Wimp's legacy. All right, cool. Mr. Ricky Campbell, Pontotoc, Mississippi. Do me a favor. Please introduce the one and only Schooner River Kennel. <laughs> oh, how do you do that? You know, it's 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 a long, it, it'd be hard to introduce that. That was all started with Mr. Winston there, you know, back 1960s, uh, the early 60s. But uh, I'm afraid I would do it in, injustice if I tried to introduce it. Uh, I tell you what. But yeah, yeah. We're home uh, of many a winner. Queen yeah, one. What, what queen are we up to now? 16? We have got 17 on the ground. Uh, we're hunting 16, 17's a putt. Well, actually, uh, her sister, uh, went hunting last night. So yeah, 17's in the making. They're eight months old now. Oh, uh, 17 so generations, man. Yeah, man. It's just amazing. You can take a line of dogs and just go that far through a very, very selective breeding program. Like Mr. Aaron had, he, he looked for certain things in dogs, you know, and, and, <laughs> was a great dog trainer and a great dog critique uh he, he he'd show you more of the bad stuff in the best dogs than he yeah. he would tell you the good stuff in the good dogs well you know i i heard him talk one time and i was listening to him and he was talking about brains and i was like oh man i love this fella already he yeah. loved a dog with brains he liked a mouth and he, he liked an accurate coon hound and that's what he looked for Yes, you, you probably hit on, you know, three of the greatest traits that he looked for in the Queens to pass on. Of course, he's looking for, you know, a lot of times he's looking for color or after Queen one, you know, she was pretty white. And then he started getting a little more color on them and he liked them to look a certain way, have certain confirmation. And, and then they all had the tree and they had to be accurate and, and they had to be able to put the track between their front legs and run it to the ground if that's where it went, you know, he he wanted the dog to, to take a track and get out of here with it. You're hunting Schooner River Schooner right now, correct? I, I, I don't do a lot of competition hunting. I've never been a big competition hunter. I like to start them, and that's kind of the game I played, even with Mr. Wimp coming up through. Me and him and I started hunting together when I was 13 years old, and I'm 61 now. And uh, he, he would farm me out young dogs, and I'd hunt them and start them and this kind of thing. And, uh, and you know, then he, he'd take them off. Somebody else would do the hunt behind it. I just uh, – I never was big in the game. I, I still go to some of our small club hunts and I hunted in the past three super stakes, but, uh, you know, it's, it's just kind of a here or there. Me, I'd rather just go coon hunt and fool <laughs> with a pup, but I, I am hunting schooner some. I, I took him from a pup. Uh, he's kind of a unique story in itself. The schooner story is kind of unique, but we took him and started him as a pup. And then me and Mr. Wimp fooled with him on up till we got him going good. And then, uh, I hunted him and got some of his first wins on him in PKC. And I think I got a couple of wins on him in the UKC. And then Mark, he, he took him and hunted him some, he got some wins on him. And then we had a youth handler, Ethan Coleman, that took him and, uh, Ethan's done some good stuff with him. He finished him tonight champion, finished him to PKC champion last month, um, finished him to show champion. So, you know, you kind of hats off to Ethan there. He, he took it over and really he hunts schooner more than I do. I've got him up here right now in Pontotoc, but, uh, then hunted him several times this week, but it's just more for pleasure to me when I hunt yeah. him. So tell me about that 13 year old young man. He is a, he's a handler. I mean, he, he's going to be good. You know, he's, he's, he's got his head right. He loves coon hunting. Uh, he loves dogs. He, he'll, he'll get a dog when he. I hadn't seen it, but Mark says when he gets in from school, he'll go get a dog out of the pen, go put it on the bench, you know, and work on it on the bench for a while. But uh, he, he's fun to hunt with. We went up to Kentucky and spent a few days right before the state youth hunt and, and really played with Schooner there, put him on the ground with several different dogs and let Ethan do some mock calling on him. And, uh, you know, the young man is very good at what he does. He's, he's going to be a good handler. Carrying on that tradition, how important was it to you as a young man coming across the Schooner River line of dogs. I don't know if I'd have, which direction I'd have went with dogs. I mean, my granddad, he was, he was a red bone man. And, uh, 
I think I had a black and tan early on in my teenage years. I flew with a little bit out of Mr. Tam Young, had a black and tan dog up north. I was here in Adams, Tennessee. It was doing real good. And I ended up with a pup off him, Fiddler. And and then, you know, and I went over into the Schooner River dogs there. Me and Mr. Went was hunting some. And he kind of moved me over into them and uh, got me the first first real Schooner River dog I hunted was the uh, Schooner River Star. And I won the, uh, back then it was a PCHA. I won the state pup fraternity with her. And then she went on, we moved her around. She made grand night champion to somebody else. I don't know. But after that, I just started hunting whatever Mr. Wimp sent over, you know, wanted me to hunt a little bit, which was always good dogs. He never let me hunt anything. It was trash. He, he had good stuff. <laughs> so I had a, I had a very luxurious, uh, beginning of coon hunting. You know, I got to hunt with the Queens and, uh, and Sarge and Bark and Leopard. And I, you know, I hunted with all of them. So. I was spoiled. I was spoiled. I love, I love how Bart originally got his name. Oh yeah. Lord, he was loud. And, and Schooner should have been Bart too. He sits down <laughs> the pen all the time. He spent his early years wearing a Bart collar. He wouldn't shut up, you know, <laughs> he just sat and bark at the moon. Oh man. Well, let me ask you something. I mean, you're, you're learning from a legend like Mr. Wimp and, uh, you're, you're hunting dogs that he has just started and grew and started in what 47 48 yeah that's when he's that's probably when he started with them yeah and the Schooner started River Kennels was, yeah, that's the first registered dog was 63 it was when the first queen was registered but he started way back uh wow in the 40s yeah 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 you know what is something when you when you hunt with a gentleman that has been in the sport for that long what is something ricky that just sticks with you every day that you think about mr Wemp? integrity yeah you know that's the main thing he, he was long lived in the game you don't get that in the coon hunt business by being fake you, you have that's to right. be original you have to be a stand-up type guy what you tell somebody about a dog has got to be the way it is you know you can't you, you don't live in that world as long as mr wimp did without being very honest and uh, he was i mean he was honest to to the point where it hurt a lot of times you know i some funny stories about dogs that i really liked and went would say that dog's got to go it's not gonna hunt with us anymore <laughs> <You know>? uh, <laughs> i had a male dog out of lipper one time that i really thought was a great dog I, we called him thunder and, and mr wimp got him for me and he was a two-year-old when i got him and we hunted him there and hunted him and man he was doing good all winter we were catching coons left and right and hunting in the delta and we were hunting out of state a lot and he uh there at the end i said man mr Wimp, i'd like to find me a jip to breed old thunder too and he stood around there a minute and he said son he said we got bark standing here and he said there's a lot of good coon dogs in the world why in the world we won't breed some thunder, the thunder. <laughs> he said there's <laughs> enough dumb dogs in the world <laughs> so <laughs> he kind of busted my bubble about old thunder right quick you know but old yeah. thunder he went home and at 10 years old made night champions <laughs> <It's got laughs> <lots of money. laughs> we didn't have him but somebody made night champion at 10 years old it's something else isn't it you know uh you, you speak about integrity um yeah i think that's part of the sport really 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 we all need to focus on a little integrity yeah you know, yeah, and, and yeah. working together and not being so against each other. Right. But what I'm saying is I took a step back just because I wanted to go and enjoy my dogs. Yeah. And to be honest with you, I can't come in on the hunts, whether they're good or bad or ugly, you know, because I don't go to enough of them to know that most of my hunting is done within uh, 600 yards of my house right here. You know, I got a big river bottom here to, or creek bottom that I hunt in. And then I, I hunt over on the schooner a lot. I hunt south on the national forest up in Kentucky, close to land between the lakes. So, you know, my hunting is kind of just me a lot of times, me and my wife or my son, you know, and, and we have people come in and hunt with us a little bit that want to see the dogs. So, uh, well, tell me yeah. about your type of hunting out there. What kind of hunting do you have? Uh, mostly, mostly what we got around here is Creek bottom, you know, right here around my house where I train the pups, we've got some big open Creek bottoms, um, flood control reservoir lakes. So, you know, even in the summertime when it's dry in most places, I can always put my dogs around water. And, and and it's not bad snaky. So right here at the house, we don't really have to worry about snake bites. We still carry, you know, Benadryl and our little doctored up medicine, you know, that we give them to, you know, if they do get bit, but, uh, it's mostly Creek bottoms, hedgerows and then up in the hills, we got big timber. We get down on the management area. We've got big timber. Uh, 
I've got some leased land north of here. That's just all big hardwoods, little box, you know, little patches of cut over here and there. We like bean field races, you know, so, you know, the bottoms down here are planted in beans or corn during, uh, during the summertime. So we get some good pup training in the, in the bean fields. Boy, you get one stretched out across that bean field. It takes a good dog to get across it. Oh, it's Woo. fun. It's fun. And now they're planting the beans on closer centers than they used to be. So you, you can imagine what it's like. I can't, a coon can barely run through. I don't see how these dogs get through some of these beans nowadays. I can't walk through. I might have to go around the edges, come in the other side. <laughs> it is pretty amazing though ricky what these dogs can do isn't it it is, it is. you know and stamina. i the dogs that gone it don't get enough recognition yeah that's right you, you know uh we're so focused on the handlers and this man's won this and this man's won that and god bless them i'm glad they won it and i hope they keep winning but yeah. golly guys we need to focus on these dogs yeah, yeah. we need there's, to focus Man, there's some good dogs out there now. You know, I can tell by, by, by what they're doing and what they're winning, you know, and some of the dogs uh, that I'm getting to see around here and there's there some nice hounds out there and some really good handlers. I mean, I'm amazed at these handlers, too, the way they can do it. Yes, but it was a live filming of it. Man, I couldn't imagine they were having to go a mile over there to that dog, and then they'd almost have to run back another mile the other way to another dog. I was like, golly, man, I couldn't keep up with that dude, you know. Now, That's a young man's you game. Let me ask you something. I'm glad you brought that up. When you were growing up, is that something that you saw very often as a dog a mile this way and a dog a mile that way? No, no, it's something I never saw. I never saw that growing up. You know, we had dogs and they had a little bit of an independent nature to them, but it was nothing like, like what I see now, you know, where these dogs really get out there and they're looking to get away from another dog. And, and we didn't see that, but you know, we didn't encourage that either. And even now, like my gyps that I hunt, uh, I hunt them to pack. I want to hear them run. And, you know, when they get in a bean field and somebody makes a lose, I, it's kind of my nature. I want to see who picks that lose up, moves it on, you know, who gets in the front, who gets to the tree. So I'm kind of like in a competition hunt every night. It's just my dogs competing against themselves. And, uh, we road hunt a lot in wintertime. We put them down on the management here. The only dog that we really single out uh, will be a puppy. We always start puppies by themselves. I single them out because I want them to be independent. I want them to learn how to tree by themselves. And once they start doing a little bit, then I put them with one of these older gyps or with two of these older gyps. Uh, I still got Queen 16 and her litter mate sister here. And, and I put them together and, and let them hunt with them, you know. And mm. uh, it just helps them a little bit. They get bogged with a track. But... You say you hunt a dog alone. And that's something mm. that I have really focused on, especially with my cheddar dog. He was the really kind of the first dog I split alone as soon as he started mm -hmm. training raccoon. Mm -hmm. Uh, now Ricky, let, let's, how important is hunting a dog alone? I, I think it's myself, you know, everybody's got their own theory, but I, I think it's very important when they're young to hunt them alone and, and Schooner, we started him by himself and. You know, now if we've got him around here hunting, he's been three nights this week and he went by himself all three nights. Now, if I go tomorrow night and take him, I may put him in there with the gyps and just let him have to hustle against them. Uh, I carried him, oh, I think it was over the weekend, me and my wife carried him and the Queen 16 and the Gyp together. And Lord, I made a mistake. I turned them all out at the same time. And then Schooner, he went south and they went north and then they got north and split off on two different tracks so it took me all night to go to the trees and get them back together and get them back to the house i mean he, i think i talked to you the next day you yeah, said well i'm more out yeah he'll get along by himself he will he he, he kind of he'll solo out there but we've hunted him a lot that way is why he does it well, yeah you get him yeah. you get the other girl going on a good heart race throw him in it he'll run with them he, he's not that kind of dog he's not going to just go out there and try to get away from them but if he needs to, he will. Now you and your wife hunt together quite a bit, correct? Right. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how long, how long y'all been together? Ooh, me and my wife have been married for, this is 2024 now. We got married in 88. In so 88. In 88. Mm -hmm. And your wife's Tessie. Uh, Tessie is Tess. what we call her. Tessie. Tessie? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, let's shout out Miss T C <laughs> <laughs> she's, she's here somewhere. Yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll drag her in the picture. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But so how long y'all been hunting together and how much do you hunt together? Oh, we hunt together a lot. Uh like I say, I usually hunt by myself. We got friends that come over and hunt a little bit. Here comes Miss T C right now. She's so she this is my hunting buddy. She uh Hey Miss Tessie. 
but uh she she uh she kind of babied schooner when he was coming up you know he was he was a foster pup uh, we fostered him on a mountain cur because his mom died when he was just a day old and i was working out of state at the time so it was up to tc to take care of him so she brought him in and we put him on a mountain cur and as he got up you know she she weaned him off and fed him and got it kept him going you know She's hunted with him since he was a baby, so she probably seen him tree his first coon, and she's treated him tree the last coon he trees. So. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's special, brother. Oh yeah, yeah, we love it. Me and her turkey hunted together, deer hunted together. You know, uh, even hog hunted some at one time together. Really? See, y'all do a little bit of everything. Yeah, we had Catahoula curs too. One time, we had a pretty good pack of Catahoulas that we all hunted a lot, and I got too old for that. Got it's back rough. strictly to treat. Mr. Wimp got to picking at me about running all the trash. So uh, that's what he called my deer hunt. He said I was running trash. Running trash, man. Let me tell you. Speaking of running trash, what is, I, I see a big difference in the dogs nowadays. It doesn't seem like the dogs nowadays run as much trash. You know, it's it's funny you said that, Jason, because me, me and Wimp talked about that. He said all that came along, you know, about, he says 15, 15, 20 years ago, he started seeing it to where they just, you, you know, early back years ago, we had deer problem where our big thing was, how do you break a dog off a deer? And, and I think it was because there wasn't a lot of deer and it was new to the dogs that we had hunting and they just wasn't seeing them much, you know? And, uh, I remember the old Tritronic trash breakers, you know, that was one of the first ones I used, but Wimp had a, had a, just a square silver box. I don't know who made this thing and it had a collar on it. I don't know what it would have, how often it would shock when it did shock or how hard it shocked, but he could light a dog up with it every once in a while. And, <laughs> you know, we didn't catch deer crossing the road and we'd take them out and pour high life on a dog's back and send him on in there after the deer, you know, and directly they'd come back, but you got to get in the truck because they should tear your leg off when they got back to the truck after they got that on them. So we had all kind of little tricks, but you know, over the years they, they've kind of weaned off and, uh, I, we don't have deer problem, but we've got deer everywhere. Deer walk up down here around my kennel, so I guess they see them. And uh, if I had to say there's one thing I'd probably have to break a dog off around here now, it'd either be an armadillo or a, a rabbit, you know, but I don't have a problem with that. I, I just hadn't had any problem with off game. Yeah, yeah. I've noticed that the last two generations of dogs I've hunted have all been um, breaking bad, breaking bad spider. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I tell you what, every dog off that cross track man bred female. And I tell you what, that cross, it produced some mighty fine hounds. We got two really good ones off of it. But one thing I noticed about every stinking one of them is none of them trashed. Yeah. I, I was like, yeah. what in the world? They were just plum natural. Uh, I hope it's something we, we as hunters have bred out of, you know, over time is what I hope, because you don't see it much in your own. I hunt with a lot of different dogs and, uh, different lineages and, and, uh, and I don't see it in any of them. You know, most of them are just pretty straight. Yeah. Don't yeah. Straight. I would say the thing I see more than anything right now is slick trees. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I do see a lot of tree power. Yeah. And, yeah. I think that was the trade off. off. I mean, that's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily think that's a bad trade off at all. In all honesty, wouldn't be for me. Cause you know, you can, you can take a little keen switch and stop a lot of that slick tree and then, uh, that's right. where, where deer breaking is a lot harder, you know, That's it's, right. it's a lot easier to push them on off a tree that you don't want them to be on. Well, and it's hard, it, especially in Florida. And I, I'm sure in other parts of the country, we get a lot of raccoon that'll run four or five hours mm -hmm. and folks, oh, there's no possible way. I'm telling you, they get on these sand hills and they don't stop. Oh yeah. Yeah. And they, they will stroll buddy. And, yeah. and it was hard back in the day. You sitting there with QTR 10 M beep beeping. Yep. Yep. <laughs> and it, my God, is that a deer or is it a coon <laughs> what do you do you know now you can look down at your garmin and this is how technology folks has just changed the game you can look down at your garmin and go okay he's in the swamp yep he's in over there in a pine head you can yep. see every little thing on that garmin that's where these garments have changed yeah. the game you know? yeah yeah mr Wimp said three things really brought us to the to the new age of coon hunting and he said one of them was the wheat light that got us out of the dark and, and ivermectin got us away from heartworms. Heartworms kill dogs around here at three, four year old back. You know, we hunted a lot of wet ground. Right. So it was the wheat light, ivermectin, and then Garmin, the, the tracking collars. 
He okay. said that was the three things that really brought coon hunters to the front. Was that right there? So that's the most notable achievements we had in the coon hunting world, you know, over the past his lifetime. He's ninety when he passed away. Yeah, right. he was ninety when he passed. You know, you talking about a man that's seen some stuff. Oh yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. Believe, he could he, go on with his stories. Woo! Yeah, he's got a museum over there that's uh, and and everybody that hunted around here and, and most people from off. He had a lot of people come down. It was a bunk house and and everybody came and stayed and. uh you know, and, and it was a museum. You had stuff from Autumn Oaks. You had stuff from Tree and Walker Days, St. Jude. You, man, it was just unreal. It's the trophies and ribbons and the world hunt stuff, uh, old stuff. Magazines that would go back to volume one, edition one. You know, he never, you know, some something the, else about him. And he was clear as bell and knew every dog. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Every dog. Yeah. To the T. But yeah, one he, thing he did not like is he did not like saying which one was the best. <laughs> right. he it's hard to get him to do that but you could pin him down you could yeah, if yeah. you really pin him down he could get you down to two uh, that he really you know really thought was his his top dog you know, on his girls anyway he, he really liked them. and who was it yeah he, he really thought a lot of the queen one dog he liked her and, and then he liked my all-time favorite uh the one I think probably was the best. I know she's the best coon dog I've ever walked in the woods with. It was a queen eight dog. Mm -hmm. They called her cat. And she was Bark's mama. And uh, she, to me, she was the most accurate, fastest on the track. Strike dog is just unbelievable. She was a, a really good dog. And, and her mama was equally as good, but her mama had a little outlaw in her. You know, she had to be made. Where cat didn't have to be made. Cat was all natural. She was just just a coon dog from birth. Yeah, you know. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, and he, there's nothing like when you cut one, and they're just naturals. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. I, I remember Mr. Eddie Simmons asked him. Uh, I was probably the week before he passed away. He he came up and he said, "Mr. Wimp," he said, "I'm gonna ask you a question." He said, "I probably asked you this before. I'm gonna ask you again." He said, "What what do you consider?" as your best, you know, the best Queens that you hunted. And he told us what I thought, you know, queen eight was probably his favorite and it was cause she was a natural. She didn't have to be made. She, she did it all on her own. She's just a lot of fun to hunt. And that's breeding, bud. Oh yeah. Yeah. That's, it's all breeding. Breeding. that's all yeah. breeding. That's genetics. And I yeah. mean, when they're naturals like that and you cut them loose, I mean, they're that your work just spoke right there. That's right. That's it's just right. that simple. And that shows you what the man done for the industry. God bless him. Yeah. Yeah, you he know. did. He, he, he worked at it hard. You know, one of the things he, he told me several times, you know, there in, in the last month or so that he was alive is, uh, the one, one thing I want y'all boys to really focus on and keep going is kids. He said, get the kids involved. If he said, you don't, he said, what all you're doing with the dogs is not going to matter anyway, over That's time. Right. He said, if you ain't got the kids interested in it, keep them going. So that's, that's one reason I really, I like the youth hunts anyway, but you know, one reason I'm going to focus more on youth hunting and getting some youth handlers going. Yeah. You know, speaking of youth handlers, I, I gave a dog to a youth handler not, not long ago. And this impressed me so much. It happened today. I gave him the dog, nice little female. She was real pretty. She did not make it in the woods. It happens. You know, yep. I mean, not every one of them make it. And do you know that that's young right. man, he called me. And he said, Mr. Jason, I said, yes, sir. He's, he's 11 years old. <laughs> he calls me. He says, Mr. Jason. I said, yes, sir. He said, she's just not working out. I said, son, that's all right. He said, I love her. I, she shows and she wins on the bench, but I need a coon dog. I said, that's right. He said, would you be ashamed if I got rid of her, rid of her? But I got her a good home to, to a little girl that wants to show her. Yeah. And I said, young man, you do whatever you feels right. Yep. But yep. that showed me, number one, his parents, what they That's have right. instilled in that young man. And yeah. boy, did that, that phone call said everything for me. Yeah. That was yes. impressive. So that shout is. out to Will Nance. I'm going to tell you right now, young man, you're very special. You're very yeah, special. That's, that's kind of, that's kind of folks we need coming into Coon Hunter right there. That's, that's the, you know, yeah, that's what's going to keep us going right there. That's cream of the crop there, bud. Cream of the yeah. crop. All right, Mr. Mark Sumrall, Laurel, Mississippi. Let's go. Let's go. 
So tell me a little bit about you, sir. I never got to meet you in person. We've never shook hands. So here I am. I get to meet you. I want to know a little bit about you. What got you in this business? What got you started in this? And then what led you to the Skinner River line? Oh, I've been, I got started hunting about 12 years old with a neighbor. Just pleasure hunted off and on. It was much later before I really started any competition hunting or anything. About the end of high school, Larry started making a few hunts, and hunting some dogs. And later on, uh, I don't know. I, I got to about the time I was then a senior in high school, I met Mr. Wimp. Started hunting a lot of his dogs off and on, buying a lot of started dogs from him, hunt them a while and sell them, and start to get another one, hunt it, get a little age on them and sell them. And that's kind of the way I got hooked up with, you know, the Schooner River dogs. Yes, sir. What's kept you in them? You know, smart, they're real smart dogs. It's just been, always been easy. I, I never really liked starting a pup, so, you know, Mr. Wimp always started them and then I'd get them about the time they'd trick them by themselves, and that's kind of where I liked them. Him and, and the dogs made it easy on me. When you said they made it easy on you, let me. what is it about Mr. Wimp and them dogs that made it so easy on you? <laughs> well, you know, just that initial getting them started. He had them leading and loading and starting to mind a little bit and getting after stuff, you know. Most of them would trail easy coon or something when I would get them. And then a lot of his, you know, I hunted a lot of his in some hunts and all. Enjoyed that, you know. So now, I know Mr. Wimp, is, he was really, really big into imprinting when they were young, really doing a lot with a pup and stuff like that, correct? Yeah, he did a lot with them. Got them started early and did a lot with them. Yeah, yeah. What What are some of the fondest memories you ever had of him with with certain pups that you just remember? Oh, you know, I I really enjoyed Bark when he was a young dog. I brought him home, hunted him quite a bit, kept him around here a lot. He was a big, a fun pup and real mild and was just exciting to hunt. Enjoyed him a lot. Several of the, of the queen females, but, you know, a lot of other pups. I just would buy from him and. You know, I always was looking to make an extra dollar. And I'd hunt them and get them a little further along and pass them along to the next guy a lot of yeah, times. So how did you and Mr. Ricky hear me? We're really through, through Mr. Wimp, you know. What's the story between you two guys? <laughs> Met through that, you know, and just become friends and talk most every day. And, hunt every you know, time we get a chance together. Yeah. <laughs> Which ain't as often as we like. There's a lot of miles between us. But during season, we try to get together and hunt a lot. How many it's years about, y'all been hunt, hunting together? Oh, oh several years. Now. Yeah, several. <laughs> I don't yeah. know, really. <laughs> so, you know, I know Mr. Wimp both got you, both gentlemen, into uh, the Skinner River line. Um, and you said brains. You were talking earlier about brains, um, Ricky. And you said how big and how important that is. And I noticed right off, Mr. Summerall says the same thing. Yeah. brains brother brains yeah you know mr sumrall on brains explain to the community what you're really meaning by brain oh that that smart dog can just learn quicker you know he learns how to work a track quicker how to locate quicker you know a lot of a lot of the things he needs to know which way to go to find the coon you know kind of the territory you hunt they just you know so much that a brain helps you know, in the progression of them. If you were to say something is a standout thing in the Schooner River line of dogs right now, what is the standout trait right now? Well, that smart, that brain's going to be there and and usually going to have really good mouths. And I like a good mouth. I like a carrying, screaming mouth. And usually got them really good mouths. And they're going to tree. They're going to, you know, you let them run. they going to, don't worry about the trees going to come there. First good dog I had, or I bought an older dog, you know, to hunt a young dog with. But with an older night chip, and he was nine or ten year old dog when I got him. He was the first good dog, and then he really trained the first pup. I had a dog, first dog I ever put in a hunt. I finished him the grand night. He was twenty three months old. He he was a real nice dog. Oh, he was young, come up missing out of the pen, never really knew what happened to him. No way. 
Yeah, if he was 25 months old, he, was, he had been grand out a few months and come up missing out of the pen. Don't, don't really, don't never had a clue what happened to him. Oh, my word. <laughs> yep. What did that do to you? Oh, it just made me want to go more, I think, you know. I, of course, it probably devastated me for a while, but it was just that much desire to go more. Yeah. I borrowed his mother and then bought his daddy and made a repeat cross, went from there, you know. Always continued hunting, tried to make quite a few hunts. And that's declined over the years, but still well, you like know, to go to a hunt. When you say it's declined over the years, we kind of touched on it earlier, Mr. Ricky. What's changed here is – it used to be one hunting club and it was like 127,000 acres. We could all hunt one hunting club. Now that one hunting club, it's split into like 10 or 15 different hunting clubs. You might have 1,200 acres here and a thousand acres here. So now I'm stuck to farms. Uh, what's your style of hunting? Mr. National forest land down here is really rough hunting. It's thick, rough. And we're fortunate to have that national forest close, but the hunting's real rough and not a lot of coons. Not a lot of farmland in our area. So, you right. know, we rely on that national forest. We do now, have some private spots to hunt, but it's not a lot. Your national forest there is pretty thick hunting. It's pretty rough hunting, too. It? It's, it's downright rough. Yeah. It, that's what we run into here in Florida. It's a bunch of thickets and swamps. That's all. Yeah. That's, that's all we get. Ours is, <laughs> ours is pine trees and briars. Ooh, and cotton miles. And cotton, cotton miles. miles. And rattlesnakes. Golly, you know, speaking of cotton mouse, we cut loose the other night. And I mean, we stepped off the road and done seen two. Yeah. I mean, it's, yep. it's terrible. I mean, in Florida, you really got to watch it, man. You really got to watch it. O over the years, you know, this Schooner River line, uh, we're up to, you. I, I think you said, Ricky, what, 17? 17 on the ground. Yeah. Mark's oh, we, got her down at his house. So, Mark, you got 17 down there at your, your, at your house. Tell me about 17. She's just a big pup right now, just getting ready to get started good. Big mouth, ready ready to really get started on her now. What's your kind of dog? I like an accurate. I like an accurate dog that locates quick. Good stay put tree dog. But got to have that meat when I get there. I don't like walking to slick trees. And, and I don't like running all night. I don't mind. I like a good track dog that can get a track done in a hurry. I want them to get it finished in a hurry. I don't like beating around all night on a track. Yeah. Yeah. I can't stand that. Get one out there and just go boo, boo, boo. Oh, Come on, man. Can't do it. <laughs> you know, can't I mean, I think, in, you know, of all breeds, you know, folks say I do a, a lot of interviews on, on walkers and stuff like that. Well, it's because it's kind of what I've always hunted. And with the walker dogs I have seen, they just have a lot of drive. I mean, a lot of drive. And it seems like these last few generations have gotten diddly accurate. Diddly accurate. I, I know. Seems like we went through an era there of they treed too much, you know, and that's the reputation they got. But, you know, now you see a lot of these other breeds that tree in too much and can't track. And Ricky and said the like same the thing. Got more accurate. Yeah, Ricky said the same thing earlier. We were talking, and I told him, I said, man, you know, what is it? What is it out there? And it's the same thing. You know, it, it's yeah. just, you know, we, we have bred these dogs, like we were speaking earlier, one mile this way, one mile that way, and you got the hunts over with by the time you make it to all the dogs. Yeah. And, and, and Daddy was talking to me the other day, and he said, son, back in the day, that just didn't happen very often. He said, you know, we hunted, we pack hunted. He said, <laughs> We're yeah. used to that stuff. I, I'm like that's part of the more accurate is they over there by themselves and not competing each other to get treated as quick. I think that's a little bit of the being more accurate. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure it has something to do with it. And, um, you know, when a dog gets solo, he's also showing he's got a brain of his own as well. It's a strong one, a right. strong will that's dog. Right. You know, and that dog is getting in there working hard, folks. That's a hard dog to beat, especially if he has meat yeah, at the yeah. end. Yeah. You and know, on I, them bad nights, for sure. Ooh, you get a cold-nosed dog on a bad night, you're in trouble, boys. 
Yeah. <laughs> you in trouble. That's right. I, mean, I think that's just what happened down there in Mississippi. I mean, I know there was controversy over, you know, that what was it, 1,800 points that was scored? Yeah, I, I don't heard remember. It was pretty, it's it's pretty something high. Like, it was way up there. But they said that dog was just boom, 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 right there on them edges. And he was just yeah. laying them up, buddy. Yeah. That's and what it, I heard. He's, I heard he was just treating them like squirrels, you know, like a good cursed squirrel dog. He said he was just nailing them. Yeah, they hey, said it wasn't having to ability. go anywhere, just, just getting them right there and having yeah. long days of fields. Yeah. yeah, and they said yeah. folks on the cast were saying everywhere you looked, you could see a raccoon sitting up. <laughs> yeah, that's what, that's what the guys were saying. Yeah, yeah, so I mean, it's pretty amazing. I mean, I was like, oh, 1,800 points, that's crazy. But you also got to sit there and think, I've had nights where, I mean, I figure I got an average dog, and he has treed seven in one night and made it look pretty daggone easy before yeah and it was all in one little pocket and i'm thinking if i was in a hunt this is the game over boys <laughs> yeah you know so I it just worked out right it did right place right time so how many what what kind of got you two guys involved in the schooner river line you said uh right, we're going to take it together and we're going to run with it mr wimp kind of got us involved mr wimp hooked us up you know Mark's got a great strength of, of knowing people, knowing dogs. And like I said, I, I, Mark was two-time PKC hunter of the year. So, you know, he's, he's been around it. He knows the hunting side of it. And, uh, I never did, you know, I, I, like I said, I started hunting when I was 13. I had my first gun river dog when I was 13, but as far as competition hunt, I never did do a lot, but I, I had a lot of gun river dogs and, uh, that's, yeah. that's my game. I like playing with the pups. That's right. Mark likes to take them after they become, you know, get past the pup. He likes to take them on, but, uh, he touched on it a while ago. You know, the brains comes in, you can see it when they're young and I can now, I mean, I can get one of our pups here and, and just fool with it just a little bit. And you can see whether that dog is going to be a dog that's going to tree coons and it's going to do it right. It's going to be quick. You know, you can see it all. I've got a little 14 week old pup down here in the pen right now that I can guarantee you he is going to be a jam up little ace. You know, when he gets six months old, he's going to be ready to go to the woods because he's just smart. He, he'll see it. He'll do whatever you tell him to do. You know, he's just a good pup already loading in side by side. So you can see that smart when they're young. If you just fool with them a little bit, you'll see it come out. Yeah. And then you I, get them to that. Mark can take them, make them tree coons in. <laughs> yeah. And Mark, you know, on, on the competition side, I mean, you, you, sir, I mean, you, you got the accolades to back it up. I mean, you really do. Uh, on the competition side of things, what would you say is probably the most overlooked thing on becoming a ha on becoming a great handler? Oh, I think most of them, you know, most of these young guys just not thinking ahead, you know, thinking what can go and keeping up with what's going on. You know, you got so many of them just want to rack up a big score. And not worried about, especially the PKC part. I think it's you know just when you can. And then I always tell these young guys that hunt with me too. You know, let's let's concentrate on winning the cast and let it fall where it may. Then you know, but okay. most you know like your bigger PKC hunt. You know, as long as you win your cast, you're moving on. It don't matter what the score was. That's exactly right. My dad told me many a time. He said, "Let me tell you something. You keep your mouth shut when all them dogs blow in there and run that mouth." Don't strike your dog unless you know it's right. He said, yeah. let them get them first and first and first and first. He said, and you know what's going to happen? They're going to get minus, 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 minus. It's going to burn them for long. That's yeah. exactly right. And them hour hunts, boys, I'll tell you what, you better be careful and you better know your dog. I, I, I asked Mark back years ago, you know, when I was first starting to fool with some of the PKC hunts again, after I'd quit hunting competition for a long time, I said, Mark, give me a trade secret, man. What do I need to do? You know, to get some of these dogs cast wins, he said, call the dog for what it's doing and not for what you want it to be doing. He said, then let the dog win the hunt for you. And, and I found that was so true. When I started doing that, I started getting cast wins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And that's advice you never forgot, is it? I never forgot it. And I pass it along like Mark to kids. Mark, I told him a while ago, I touched on Ethan a little bit about a sharp little handler he's turning into being, you know, a good kid. Loves dogs, loves everything about dogs. And Mark can even, he can elaborate, you know, a little bit more about what our young handler's doing and, you know, what we think of him. So tell me a little bit about Ethan. 
I'm always just a good kid, just really well behaved and wants to be outside, not interested in the video games much, you know, not interested in a cell phone. Wants to be outside, you know, it don't matter if you're working or playing or, you know, riding a horse or hunting or what. He wants to be outside doing something. He's a, he's a young 12 year old and, you know, old, I don't know, he's, he just got the old ways about him in a lot of ways, you know. What is something you think is one of his strengths right now? Oh, he just, he's, he's pretty good about listening and, you know, paying attention and, you know, he's learning real quick. He, he's got a lot to learn naturally, but he's learning real quick and, and he can pick the dog up real quick. He knows, you know, he knows his dogs pretty well, you know? Yeah. Yeah. How old is he? He just turned 12. He's a young 12. Well, he was 12 in August. I'm telling you folks, we young, we got some up and comers right now, 11, 12, 13 year old kids that are yep. turning and burning with these dogs. Yeah. And you know, I mean, the ones that especially can, you know, they're not like Ethan. We've moved him around two or three dogs and, and he's one with more than one, you know, can, you know, we might like one better than the other one, but you know, if one's not here or whatever, he's okay with taking whichever one. He's not scared to get out there and try. Yeah. Yeah. Like Ricky, Ricky said earlier, how important it is to have the youth in this sport. We've got to keep pumping the youth in the sport, you know, uh, got to do something to keep them interested. That's exactly right. You know, there was one that contacted my mom the other day and Oh, mama had this beautiful pup she picked and didn't want to get rid of, but this young and contacted her and mama said, I got to do it for the young, you that's know, right. you know, and that's, uh, I, that's what the sport's all about. It's giving back and doing the right thing and getting these youngins in it. If we can keep getting these youngins in it, the sport's going to really do well. You know, a lot of them struggle too. I mean, they can't afford a light or can't afford boots and you know, that's what Ricky's helped Tathan with some of that stuff. And, you know, that just, you know, give them an opportunity and it comes back, you know, it'll come back. Yeah. yeah you Tenfold never miss sometimes. that kind of stuff. You never yeah. miss that kind of stuff. Man. No, yeah. man. You don't, you know, we're, we're going to be doing a, a giveaway for a young man that, uh, just had a brain tumor removed. And, um, yeah, I, you know, it's things like that, folks. <laughs> You better take care of these youngins that are trying to get into sports, trying to get their minds off of things, you know? Yeah, help them a little bit. I mean, a little bit, if everybody will help just a little bit. That's right. And that's what we're all trying to do, just give a little to him, you know, make sure we get him outfitted, yeah. make sure we get him in the woods. That's it. Yeah. You know, and that's the most important part of this sport. And, Ricky, you nailed it earlier when you were talking about it. You were saying, we got to keep the youth in the game, and that's what Mr. Wimp was all about. Yeah. Yeah, he's, he's stressed at all time. Yeah. If everybody yeah. helps a little bit, you know, and, you know, whether if it's money or time or a light or a used light or, you know, save that pair of boots that one kid's outgrown, get them to another one. All that kind of stuff just helps these kids. And, you know, a used pair of boots to a new hunter, boy, that's a big thing. He's proud. He don't know what to do with them. So then I get out there and I just go to rubbing in the water and I want to clean them off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah mark, mark he's he's the best about pairing them you know he he knows what skin is gonna cross better on probably than i do uh, he he just been in that side of it a lot more with reject you know he knows what reject does well i've got two reject gyps here right now that i think the world of you know i'd rather hunt them than any dogs walking Mark, and, let's tell tell me a little bit about reject. I mean, I remember reject for, for those that don't know reject. Tell me a little bit about re reject and kind of what he done in life. Oh, he's just really been an old pet most of his life. Never been pushed in any hunt, really. Uh, one of my buddies put him in two or three UKC hunts. I put him in one, and he put him in two, and made him. We made him night champion, and. Never really planned on taking him any further. And then I had a young kid hunting with me, and he didn't like me going on the cast with him. So he wanted me to, you know, I was taking him to hunts. He wasn't old enough to drive. So then I, I started taking Reject with me, and I won. Oh, I think I took him to, he just had to have five cast wins there, and I think I just took him to, to six and got his five wins and then had him grand night and then, 
one of the kids that hunted with me put him in a few hunts. He's never been in any hunts like really, you know, one seven or eight hundred dollars and made grand night. He I've just enjoyed hunting him. He's really throughout it's really been fun to hunt. Pretty much anything we've bred him to, you know, most of the pups that's given given a chance have done well. And something I've noticed with the schooner line, boy, y'all y'all's dogs, not only do they have the hunt, the mouth, the brains and all that, but well, they got the look too. Well, they got the look. Most of them have. We, we have a few ugly dogs. We get a few ugly ones there once in a while. I <laughs> think we all do that. <laughs> they just don't get in front of a camera a whole lot, Jason. Them ugly ones don't. I don't know. They camera shy. A couple of them ugly ones get quite a few pictures too. <laughs> well, that's all right. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, I mean, y'all, I've seen that. I, I know for a fact that y'all, y'all have all uh, shown your dogs, championing them out on the bench and stuff like that. I remember an old story that uh, I think Mr. Wimp told a story years ago. He had a dog broke his leg, and then he ended up not only to break his leg, uh, later on made him a champion or grand champion on the bench. Yeah, that was Bark. He made yeah. grand champion after he had a broke leg. Now, I mean, and that's something that's pretty neat to me is your older generation. They really like that confirmation. They wanted a good looking yeah. dog. They want them to look like the breed standard and they want them to hunt and do both. Yeah. You know, I, not, not counting color, but I think you like, you just touched on there, the breed standard and the confirmation at all meant a lot to the older hunters because they thought they was going to, you know, and they was, they was going to last longer, you know, right? they was going to make it longer, you know, better confirmation and like well and they do they, they they hold up better i mean it's just facts are facts i mean yeah. <laughs> if you're built right you run you can run right well, mr Wilt bred for you know for longevity because because i don't think there's probably many people when he was younger i know that probably nobody hunted as much as he hunted because when he somebody told you he hunted seven nights a week he hunted seven nights a week and it wasn't going to go out there and turn them out like I do sometimes for two or three hours and come back to the house. He'd hunt them and see the sun come up the next morning, go to bed, and he'd hunt them again, you know. And, and yeah. still, when he was 90, you know, he was still hunting two, three nights a week until he got so sick. And, uh, but man, he hunted. I mean, he really hunted. And when he was in his 60s, I, <laughs> I was in my late 20s and early 30s. and. I still couldn't keep up with him in the woods. I mean, he's just, he's like a horse going through the woods, but he, he had to have a dog that could last him. You know, he, he thought they had needed to be able to get six, seven, you know, eight years out of one. His dogs had done had some miles put on them. And uh, I know he looked, you know, he cut a few dogs up, look at the heart, you know, check them for heartworms because he was really testing the Ivermec theory, you know, did it, did the cattle Ivermec work good? So he looked at that and, and he also started looking at, the the heart you know whether the heart was enlarged whether it was hard soft and you know those old ships that he hunted and run them you know till they were 10 years old six seven nights a week they'd have big stout hard hard harder hearts uh you can tell that was a muscle that really developed in them and man that was from that all them hours in them bean fields and swamps running yeah uh, he bred for that you know deep chested big barreled dogs Good lung capacity. Yep. I think every queen since Queen 3 and Mark and Lipple, that he cut the heart out of every one of them, Lipple, mm -hmm. after they mm -hmm. passed. And, you know, most of them lived 12, 14 years old. Yeah. How, how long did old 8 live? She lived. She was like 13, wasn't she, when she died? I know a couple of them was 13 or, you know, uh, and I think 10. You know, 10 yeah. was on up there about 14 when she died. Yeah. I, I think old cat, Queen Eight, you know, was a fair age. Does Queen Twelve? Man, we had her down here. She is twelve years old. Yeah, yeah she. Pups with her now. Yeah, she it ain't been too long ago that she died. She was old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, that shows you longevity. <clears throat> All right, gentlemen. So everybody wants to know, when this is the hard part about raising dogs or starting your own line of dogs or anything like that, when you're breeding hounds. Let's talk about breeding hounds and how hard is it to raise a litter of pups, a litter of puppies. Uh, Mark, if you'd like to start for me, kind of what your procedure is and how you go about it. Well, my favorite procedure is I like to get a buddy that likes to raise them and send the dogs to his house. Like old Ricky? <laughs> no, I got 
Well, I, now I got a couple of good buddies around close here. I hate to start throwing names, but I got Chris and Ainsworth and Joey Daltrey down here by me that they really enjoy taking a female that's bred when she starts showing, taking them and, and raising the pups. And they're a lot better at it than I do. And both of them, you know, have a, a climate controlled where they can really keep up on them and and they do very good jobs, you know, better than I do raise them. But I think, you know, basically you got to have a pen set up to keep them warm, dry, or cool. It just depends on the weather. And nutrition, you know, really good feed. I think several of the vitamins that, that we use kind of helps too, you know. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of time and effort goes into it. Some of my buddies, like I say, are a lot better than I am at it. But you know, I love to raise a litter, and I love it. You know, when they eight or nine weeks old, I'm ready for them to go, and I want them back when they're seven months old, or eight months old, or ten months old. But, you know, it's it's a lot of work goes in that people don't realize. And then the price of everything's went up. We we pay all our pups up both the ways. You know, time you do that, you got a lot of money in each pup. Well, yeah, and that's something not, that a lot of folks don't forget. They forget how much it is to pay, pay a dog up in super stakes, performance, and all that stuff. I mean, that stuff costs yeah. money. You, you can have, you know, $150 a piece in papers per pup. That's right. Easy, and then, you know, time you give them shots and worm them, you know, you've spent $300 on a pup to raise him, right? And then a lot of people think you're supposed to sell them for two hundred dollars. Yeah, especially if you got a good quality female that you spent a lot of time on to, to put some titles and stuff on her. To, you know, the books are worth more. Yeah, well, I mean, they forget about the miles up and down that road. Yep, and the many a nights laying out there, That's getting exactly. them ready to go. You know. Yeah, I mean, the night spent in the woods, folks, is <laughs> how many nights a week do you hunt, Mark? Oh, uh, lately I've been having a lot of back trouble and I'm just hunting a couple of nights a week right now. But now I, I like to go when I'm really hard at it. I go, you know, four, four nights a week by winter time. You know, I'm off Thanksgiving week and a couple of weeks at Christmas, a lot of time like that. And I'll go to the places and stay the whole time, you know, hunt every night through that, a lot of that, you know. Ricky, what's your what? How, what's kind of the way you address it? How do you do a lot litter pups, and how do you start them, and kind of what age? Well, you know, back back before Mister Wimp passed away, he he raised all of my pups for me. You know, he he was the pup man. You could take them to him. He had two brood houses set up so he could take two chips at a time. He'd raise them up, and then you know I'd take them uh, from that, and you know hunt them when they were six seven months old, get them started, and then we introduce them to the other dogs and just hunt them all together. But, uh, I've got a climate control, uh, brood house, uh, with, you know, heat and lights and butane heaters in it for this time of the year, or we air condition it, cool it for the summertime. Uh, y'all kind of do it the way Mr. Wimp showed me how to do it. I, I try to keep the, keep the pad, you know, where the pups lay on about 90 degrees for the first two or three weeks and the, and the heat in the room, I try to hold it about 80, 82 degrees. I always get my females in good shape before I breed them. You know, I want them wormed out good. I want them top shape, healthy, not too fat, but, you know, healthy. I'll leave them hunt them a little bit while they're carrying the pups, you know, just give them some exercise and stamina because cause what they got coming to them, you know, raising the pups is pretty tough getting them here. Uh, when the pups get here, uh, Mark turned me on to some stuff. It's called uh, Oxymama, I believe is what it is. It's, uh, it's a supplement. And. Uh, we had a jip here last year. She lost her pups, just just she didn't produce any milk and, and lost a whole litter for us in 23. And we got her back and bred her again this year and put her on that, that supplement a little bit before, like two weeks before she had pups. And now when she's nursing, she gets up milk and still be running out of her. So, you know, it's, it's, it's critical to get that a lot of milk in them. And then I, I worm them at two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, and eight weeks, the babies. And then after they come off mama, I never give them a shot till they come off their mama. But as soon 
as they come off their mama, I give them shots and, and make sure they get the shots four, eight, 12, and 16. And, uh, but like Mark saying, it's just so much goes into pups now, you know, the registration, I just literally registered eight here today and it's, it's expensive, you know, time you pay you, you stud dog up in super stakes and performance and, and then you slid to register pups and get them all paid up, ready to go to put them in the right people's hands to get them hunted. Uh, you know, it's easy to have $300 in a pup time. It's just eight, 12 weeks old. Yeah. Yeah. And that's true. But, I mean, not to mention feed. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And we feed, you know, we, we, we keep plenty of feed, different kinds in front of them. Just good, yeah. high quality feed. And, yeah. Uh, now, Mark, what, what age do you like starting the dog, brother? And, and when I do, I'd probably let mine get a little older than a lot of people. I like them to be eight months old or so. I like 11 months old and uh, three easy coon coming into the winter. And then just, you know, hound them. I, I like to hunt them early by themselves. And then later in the night, I'll hunt an older dog or, you know, a, maybe an 18 month old or something, you know, that's, that's already getting some good time on them. Hunt them late. And, especially like when I go to the big woods, I hunt on a horse a good bit. When I do that, I like to hunt a, you know, a young pup early when the coons are moving and older pup late and hunt them by their self a lot. Yeah. You know, and that's important. And, and I think that that's something that we all need to remember is sometimes starting these pups at six months, seven months, that's really young. That's really young. Some of them need to mature and some of them mature really late. Yeah, and they're all different too. You know, they can be yeah. so much different. Well, uh, what age have you you seen most of your Schooner River dogs? What age is it they typically start turning it on? You know, you see so many that are are really young, and I see you know, you know maybe some people push them a little harder than I agree with, but I've seen a lot of these pups six months old treating cones by themselves. You know, fairly regular, not just every time you cut them, but you'll see a lot of them six seven months old really three coons by theirself well now what age is it you like a little early what it yeah <laughs> a little bit but it's all right man if they doing it they doing it huh yeah it is fun when they doing it yeah i got a picture of uh we have timer and i got a picture video uh from dick brothers the other day he sent me a video of timer and he was just pup up there every breath on one i was like oh my lord <laughs> yeah. and he wasn't he wasn't that tall you know, and uh, bless his heart, he's almost six now, and uh, just a pleasure to own. Uh, Mark, what is what age is it you like to get a dog and start hunting them? I like a year old, you know, to, to really start pushing and start trying to tune on a little bit. But I really would rather be a year and a half old or so before I go to a hunt. I, I just, you know, they can, they can learn them bad habits a lot quicker than they learn the good ones. Hey man, <laughs> if you get if you get too many hunts young, so what you gonna get started? That's right. And when you start hitting the hunts with them, you just you all in? No, not really. I I'm not one to just burn them down. My favorite hunt is the super stakes, but I like to just get one's money one, and, and I, I guess it's my favorite because I've never been very lucky there. <laughs> I can't get very far. Seems like but I just like the hunt. I like to you know. The, the one year old, the two year old, you know, I like that. It's fun, isn't it? Yep. What yeah. keeps you in the sport, Mark? I don't, I don't, I just never remember much not hunting, you know, just there's been a few times in my life I slowed down, but I've never quit since I was 12 or 13. I don't know. I guess I'll go long as I can go. Ethan has helped me a whole lot because we'll go ride the side by side or hunt out of the truck or whatever. And, you know, if the dogs is real deep and I've been having this back trouble, if I can get him fairly close, I won't let him just go too far. But if I can get him fairly close, he'd be in there and out before I need to think about it. <laughs> nice to have that sidekick. It? Oh man. That young, young helps a lot. And I've had oh. a lot of young guys hunted with me since, I guess since I was 18 or 19, there's always been a younger generation. To, you know, there's probably been, I know, 30 or more young kids hunted with me. Uh, boys and some young girls has hunted with me quite a bit. And, I, you know, I think it's helped them a lot, kept them out of a lot of trouble. 
most all of them have turned out to be, you know, pretty good folks as they grew up. I want to ask both you gentlemen something. Um, If there's something, how many years you both have, have you both been in this sport? If you don't mind me asking. I've been in it it 48 years myself. I'm 61. I started hunting when I was 13. What is something that has, has changed the game? Uh, and I, and we spoke on this earlier, Ricky, uh, but as far as handling and dogs, what would you say has changed the most? And Ricky, I'll start with you first. I, I think one of the things that's changed the most in my area is, is probably one of the things that's going to really be a detriment to a lot of the younger hunters is the availability of land to hunt on. Uh, and, and you touched on it a while ago, the 12,000 acre block being broke up to a thousand acres, you know, when I was coming up, you could hunt anywhere around here. There was not a posted sign. You could go anywhere. I'm still fortunate enough, you know, that I grew up hunting here and I can go about anywhere I want to hunt. And, and uh, several of us older hunters can, but the young, younger hunters aren't, they, they don't have that luxury, you know, they, they just certain places they can go. We do have a national forest south of us and one north of us, but you know, for, for summer hunting, it's just tough. It's just tough. Yeah. Mark. <clears throat> Well, I think, you know, the the most has changed, you know, maybe when I was younger, there just wasn't a lot to do. We could go work, we could haul hay, we could do whatever. But, you know, nowadays there's so much for the younger folks to get into, so much activity. You know, there's, I mean, my even my high school had a baseball and a football team. You know, nowadays they got volleyball and soccer and so many things for the young guys, young kids to get into. Besides, you know, the parents aren't hunting now. Of course, I didn't have parents that hunted and, you know, was lucky to have some neighbors hunted, but, you know, the, the adults are not taking the kids and and there's so much for the, for the young kids to get into besides hunting. Right. And it hunting's work. It, you know, it's work. It's not easy. So a lot of them don't like to put forth effort, you know. You know, I think you really just stated a uh... <laughs> the truth right there is when you said hunting is not easy it takes a lot of dedication yep a lot of work yeah and i think that's why you were you were speaking earlier about how they've all turned out to be great folks and usually those great folks are the ones that stuck it out yep yeah a dog can teach you a lot if you listen yep and they teach a lot about itself yeah, a lot of those kids that hunted with me, you know, way back now, they've got kids that are hunting with me and stuff. It's, you know, not all of them stuck with hunting, and some of them quit for a number of years and then get back, you know. It's been all different with all of them, but, you know, most of them, like I say, most of them turned out to be good, upstanding folks. Yeah, and competition hunting, what would you say has changed the most, Mark? Well, I think the dogs have changed more than anything. You know, of course, like everybody knows, used to, it was who could get the call out quickest. They was all packing together. Now you hardly see dogs together. And a lot more money out there now that people are getting to hunt for. Them. And and the youth hunts, I think, is a is a positive change that we're seeing. There's some good youth hunts now. That, man, I wish we'd had something like that when I was young. My goodness. I mean, they're giving away four-wheelers. I mean, all kinds of cool stuff. Yeah. And I mean, there's Good some money, that are giving scholarship. I think, scholarships. Yeah. I mean, that's if yeah. I was young growing up, my goodness, boy, would I be having a coon hound at the end of my leash. <laughs> I'd be finding the, the, the neighbor or whoever had the best one around, and that's who I'd buddy up with. Yeah. <laughs> He'd be my new fishing partner. And him. <laughs> you know, what is uh, one of the fondest memories, Ricky, you have, Mr. Wimp? Oh, man, I have so many. It's hard to say. Like I say, I hunted with him for 48 years. Uh, I, some of the most funny ones uh, are probably some of my fondest. Uh, a lot of my fondest didn't actually happen on the hunt. They'd be sitting around at the Waffle House or truck stop eating supper after we get through hunting all night or eating breakfast early, you know. Or traveling, you know, going up and down the road. Mr. Went was just a fun guy to be around. It didn't necessarily have to be in the woods, but uh, one of the most funny things, I guess, is me and him was hunting on a big lease. I was in the big black bottom, back river bottom down around Eupora, and we treed, I think, Queen 8 or 7-1 had treed across the river from us. And uh, 
the river was up pretty high and it was a set of cables that went across the river and it's funny now, but it wasn't then. <laughs> he, <laughs> he told me, he said, I believe you can make it across that. He said, you just put your feet on the bottom cable, hold on to the top cable and you can get across. And I said, well, I can't get up there to get to it. And he said, well, I can get you up there. And he backed his horse up there to it. And I climbed up and saddle climbed up on it. And I get started across and I get about halfway out there and my, I done stretched out. My tiptoes was on the bottom cable by then because everything was swinging down, you know. The bottom cable wasn't as tight as the top cable. And I, I said, Mr. Wimp, I just can't do it. And he said, you ain't got much further to go, you know, and you'll be on in the big black canals, a big old body of water coming down through there wide open top of the paint. I said, I can't do it. I'm coming back. I, I, I get back to that side and I'm done. Man, I scared and shaking. He said, uh, he said, I can't believe you did that. He said, I wouldn't have tried that. And when I, I got home, I was telling my wife about it. And she said, why did you do that? I said, well, Mr. Wimp told me to. He said, you just do everything he tell you to do. <laughs> I said, well, most things I try anyway. <laughs> but, that was, but we had a lot of funny stories, you know, and, and riding up down the road with him was always hilarious. He, he never met a stranger, you know. Yes, yeah, just good stuff, man. Sitting man, around you're... the old shop talking after the hunts was you learn a lot, learn a lot. And I, and I never quit learning and, and probably should have been taking more notes because my memory fails me now a lot. Mark, what is uh what's the memories that really, really stuck with you? Oh, uh, you know, there's just like Ricky said, you have so many. I spent so much time with him. You know, it was it was always we all talked about it. Anybody was with us. If you go to eat, Wimp was gonna pay, and oh, he'd get upset if you went and paid. You know, or somebody snuck up there and paid, he'd he'd get upset with you about it. But, you know, maybe more than the hunting. Like Ricky said, a lot of the nights when you get in, that time, you know, at home. Just the talks. Yeah, it's kind of yeah. tough to talk about it sometimes, Jason. I mean, we, me and Mark, it's we kind, right, of, brother. kind of growed up living there with you. Yeah. Yeah, those, right, those talks meant a lot. Meant a lot. Yeah, yeah, and then memories, yeah, man. Was, you know, whether it was about breeding the dogs or, you know, what you was looking for in a dog or, or what was going on at home or, Whatever, you know, just you'd sit there. Well, if the weather was too bad to hunt, you know, you still wasn't going to bed till four o'clock, four or five o'clock in the morning. And he's gonna keep something going, you know. Yeah. Those yeah. trips I, to I, the huddle house. I wasn't you even a big like, basketball fan, but he'd uh we come in a lot of times from hunting, he'd say, Come on, playoffs is on. Me and he would go watch basketball and I didn't even like yeah. basketball. We'd sit there at daylight and watch basketball, you know. <laughs> But, uh, man yeah it's cool I, stuff you know and I, I i just want to say mark thank you so much for sharing it with me i mean really brother i i know he meant a lot to both of you guys and uh i i think y'all are going to carry on this tradition uh beautifully and uh to see both of you wearing schooner river kennel hats i mean hey hey i love it I, yeah yeah hey, it's we... not just us you know it's a it's a i mean there's hundreds of people that he appreciated hunting the dogs and taking the time and, and like I say it's not gonna be just me and Ricky it, it's a lot of we got a lot of good friends because of yeah. this. Yeah, keep it going, man. It just take it's gonna take the coon hunters that that, that really like the Schooner River breed of dogs, you know, and you look on a lot of different breeds now and if you look back far enough you'll find some Schooner River in there somewhere. So it's it's everybody, you know, taking a big role in it. He, he told yeah. my son, Mr. Wimp told my son, you know, my son did part of the, uh, his eulogy there at the funeral. And he told Rick, uh, when he was telling him he wanted him to do the funeral, he said, uh, when you get there, he said, before you close, he said, you make sure that you tell the hunters that's in there that I really appreciate everything they did for me and for the dogs and, and getting it to where he's going. So. He he really thought a lot of his hunt buddies, man. He he's, he's amazing. Yeah. And folks like that are special, man. Oh yeah. yeah. So special. Can't be replaced. Can't be replaced. 
No. He didn't no. take anybody for granted. You know, he appreciated everybody. Yep. I wish yep. there was more of that. Yep. You know, I, I and I really hope that uh, everyone listening to this podcast, you know, I hope y'all see how much that gentleman meant to these two gentlemen and, and the impression he made on their lives. Because uh, if you think that we do this because we just want a raccoon hunt, that's that's not it. Sometimes it's about the relationships you make in life. Yeah. You know, and yep. then uh, like, you know, y'all are carrying on a tradition, man. It's beautiful. I love it. We're I trying. Yeah. We try. That's all you can do, big guy. That's, That's all you can do. Big, big set of shoes try to fill, but we try. Uh, we'll you make know, mistakes, but we can keep going. One thing about it, you learned from one of the best, didn't you? Yep. yep. God bless it. We got to tell you, and I, I got a good friend right now, Dick Brothers. And every time I talk to him on the phone, I say, Dick, I just want to learn something. Every time I can learn something yeah. from him, I just want to learn something. My daddy, he's 75 in here. Or he'll be 75 this year. And, uh, I, I just want to, every time I go hunt, I, dad, you won't go, you won't go. And he's getting up there now to where it's harder to get around in the woods. And, uh, but he'll still he'll get out there and he'll go. Cause it's, it's like you said, it's the missed moments. You don't want to miss them. Yeah. Cause one day they yeah, will yeah. be gone and it's our job to carry on this tradition. Yeah. I just, I hope I can make it just nearly as long as Mr. Wimp did hunt. You know, that's, uh. I saw him there, you know, as he got older in years, just crossing the ditch would be a hard thing, you know, and, and he would not let you help him though. I mean, don't stick your hand out to help him cross the ditch. He did that on his own, go walking through the woods. You know, he, you might get in front of him and try to push a stick out of the way. If you saw it, something he might be going to trip on. If he seen you do it, he'd call you out for doing it. Uh, I've seen him lay down on his back cause he couldn't look up a tree. His neck be still lay down on his back and shine a tree, look for a coon lay flat down <laughs> so yeah he, he had his way of you know getting it done even after he got older and it you could tell it hurt him a lot you know to go coon hunting but he did not quit he stayed at it that's beautiful though that's beautiful you know my my dad he say well boy he don't you help me <laughs> yeah you go i can do this <laughs> i can got this i'm all right i'm over yeah. over tripping and rolling yeah. The swamp. <laughs> yeah that's what i'm talking about you know those memories you know, the, are special. The things that we 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 didn't used to think about. You know now that you start thinking that if we can influence one one young person the way we were, it'll all be worth it. Yep. Yeah. It'll Beautiful all said. be worthwhile. Well, gentlemen, yeah. I'm gonna tell you something, and I I mean this. Thank you so much for coming on here, and yeah, we uh, enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too, because I'm going to tell you what Mark just said. I mean, there's no greater thing to be said. It just takes one. Yep. Just keep it rolling, you know, and, and to have two gentlemen like you on this podcast, is, it just, it means the world to me to see these kind of personalities in this world. Cause in the, in the Coonhound world, this is what we need. We need some upstanding guys that really want to. And like you said, there's a team here. Y'all have a big, big group of people. And, yeah. uh, I'm all in. I want some Schooner River now. <laughs> we'll get it for you. We can, we can fix you up there. We, yes, we're gonna have, we, we'll put that in the doctor very soon. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, uh, y'all are first class, and I just I just want to say thank you and uh, keep carrying on that that tradition because you're doing it well. Yeah, we appreciate you doing this, Jason, helping us get the word yes, out sir. there. Appreciate you helping us, you know, put our, put our binder and our ad together, man. That's great stuff. I appreciate it. Miss Laney, she, she works hard on the mads and those banners. And, uh, yeah, I tell you, she does. I even tried job. that. I tried that holler back coon squaller out this week too. I, yeah. yeah I got one man. sitting right here. Golly. She's nasty. Yeah. Yes, sir. We got to get you one there, Mark. Yeah. I got to have one. Oh, we're going to slip one on you. Like that. Yeah. I have to fix, fix Ethan yeah. up too before long here. Oh, he yeah. ain't going to have to wait for long. It's coming. <laughs> <laughs> hey, gentlemen, God bless you guys. Thank you much. Ladies and gentlemen from Hunter's Will House, Ricky Campbell, Mr. Mark, I, I just want to say thank you so much for both you gentlemen coming on here and being first class. I mean, anything else y'all would like to say? No, we enjoyed hey. it, Jason. Thank you for having us. Absolutely. We, we appreciate it. And if there's any way we can help anybody, we'll do our best. Yep. Y'all are first class, man. Take care and God bless. Thank you, you guys. Too, brother. Thank you, man.